Hello and welcome everybody. It's great to have you here. My name's Jeff, if we haven't met before. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Happy Mother's Day. Wow. Woo, that's great. Now, Mother's Day is great for most people, which is great, but there's some people where their mother has passed away, and so that's a sad reason. There's other people that never could be mothers themselves, which is hard, and that's a grieving time, but also you might not have had a very good mother, so Mother's Day isn't that great sometimes. But I want to talk about a great mother. Here it is in Proverbs chapter 31, and it says, she speaks with wisdom and faithful instructions is on her tongue. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he, is, he praises her. That's what we want to be, great mothers like that, don't we? But we love the children, teach them in the ways of God. One way of doing that is teaching them different songs. And so here's a nice song that we're going to be singing. It's called, Oh, the Mighty Hand. Let's sing it together.
want to thank God for mothers. We want to praise him for his goodness shown to us through his mothers. So let's keep on praising him uh, in song now as well. Thank you. church, Mike Littlefair is my name. Normally I would welcome at this point not just the people in the building but those online. Uh, today there's no one online. We, we actually haven't been able to successfully stream. Uh, for whatever reason we can stream pictures today but no sound so unless you'd be a good lip reader you wouldn't actually be able to understand anything that's going on. You'd have to sing completely to yourself without any music. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to record the pictures and the phones are up here because we're trying to record the sound Later today we're going to try and merge the two together and then upload it to YouTube uh, because we do know that there's about 50 people who watch uh, during the week from Canberra to the south coast to Campbelltown to a whole bunch of places, uh, not just locally. So we want to serve that community. That's why we tried to make things work and we're a little bit late today. Uh, but it is good to have you in the building. Welcome for braving the weather outside and uh, for being here on Mother's Day. A few announcements to let you know what's going on in the life of the church. A lot of these things are in the newsletter that's on the, on the table there in front of you. Uh, but the first thing to let you know, and I might ask the other people who are giving announcements today to come up as well uh, now too. But I wanted to let you know about Australia's Biggest Morning Tea. Uh, Australia's Biggest Morning Tea is a cancer council event that we are running here next week. Uh, it's actually an opportunity to, uh, for us as a church, link with the community in a very relevant and pertinent issue and actually at the same time share the hope of Jesus. So Carolyn Altman is speaking. She herself has suffered cancer 
and, uh, and struggle with it in her family life for many years. And she's going to come and share her story. And what's a little bit of a confronting topic? The topic is, where is God when you're fighting cancer? And she intentionally used the word fight because I guess that's how people feel it often is. It is a fight. And where is God at that time? Has God abandoned me? That's what the world would want to think. But that's not what we as Christians say. So please invite a friend, uh, invite a family member, encourage them to come, not just to give to the Cancer Council, but to hear a great Christian message. That's next Saturday here in the church, starting at 10 o'clock. Thanks, Guy. So, um, in our church here, we do Operation Christmas Child, and we do it not just, not just to send lots of goodies to little kids all over the, the um, world, but we do it because they get the opportunity to hear about Jesus, and that's what our church is on about. Um, I'd like to invite you, if you're interested, um, to our launch, a Central Coast launch. So it's not just us, it's a huge thing. And uh, if you would like to come, it's in two weeks' time. It's in, on uh, May, uh, Saturday, May the 25th at 10 o'clock. And the good news is that it's in our church. And uh, because it's a, a five-hour thing, um, you don't have to stay for the whole five hours. But if you want to, uh, Rick, um, George will be here, the new uh, regional manager, and we'll be hearing from him. So we're having lunch, and if you could, if you'd love to come, I do need to know before the day. Um, and if you'd like me to register you, um, just let me know. On um, this. Sheet is on your table, uh, it's half this size. So if you're interested, grab one of these and the link is on the bottom there for uh, the two days. So that's in 13 days time. Thank you. Now I'm going to be talking about Hope Explored. Now this is for anybody who knows about Jesus but doesn't know Jesus personally. There's a big difference. You know, you can know the Prime Minister, know about the Prime Minister, but you know the Prime Minister personally. And this is knowing Jesus personally and the benefits of that relationship. So if you don't know that, please come along on the 26th of May here at 3pm. Uh, but also if you know someone that is inquisitive, and they're sort of a bit uh, looking to Jesus but don't really know him, well, why don't you invite them along too? It'd be great to have them. Thank you. Now this week I have said at least twice what is the world coming to and I don't know if you ever have those moments but it is good to keep meeting together and there is a women's conference coming up and you're going to hear four women give about 20 to 25 minute talks. It's the 22nd of June. So what I'm here today for is if you'd like to come, if you are a lady, we are going to host it here. Now our goal is to get 10 of us to come together and this is a $20 note. This is how much it will cost us if 20 of us come. Oh, 10 of us come. 10 of us, it's $20. If it's more, if it's less, it's $22. I'll pay the $2 if you or tell me you're coming anyway. But come, we're going to have lunch together if you bring it and we're going to share morning tea. But I came last year and it was really, really great actually. I really recommend it. Come, 22nd of June. I can't make money appear like that, sorry. Uh, I'm not going to. But I was going to mention about the offering box. It's up the back. Uh, if you'd like to give to the work of our church in person, uh, in cash, we collect that. We don't hand around bags anymore. It's just uh, in a box up the back. Do it in your own time. That bag, or that box is multi-purpose. Uh, please also put your communication cards in. Uh, we are, as a church, updating our church directory. So if you want to, uh, in the coming weeks, we'll actually have a draft copy here for people to look and say yes. Uh, that's okay for me. That's my details. They're correct. I'm happy for it to be in the directory. If your details have changed, some people often change their email address or phone, just pop it on this note here, or this communication card on your table, and put it in that box at the back. If you are willing to be in the directory and would like to update your photo from a previous photo, you've said, oh, well, look, that wasn't my best smile. Uh, look, Vi will take your photo and put an up-to-date photo in. Uh, if you need a bit of Photoshopping on your photo, uh, look, I can speak to some people for you and they'll, they'll help you out. Uh, but uh, look, the directory is a way for us to stay in touch as a church family, to care for each other, to know each other, 
uh, so that we can be a family uh, of believers in the body of Christ. So please uh, be willing to be part of the directory. Now today is a very exciting day. It is Mother's Day. Uh, so we actually have, uh, can I have uh, maybe Sienna and, uh, and Amelia and maybe Ben, do you want to go and grab those trays from the foyer? And uh, we also need to have uh, Asher and Jesse and Gabriella and Frederick and Matthew, whoever Matthew is. Matthew, if you want to come. And we want to actually give all the ladies uh, a little flower to say Happy Mother's Day to them today. Now, I'm particularly intrigued to know, uh, mums, who has already received a present? A few people, not too bad. Great. Okay, hands down. Who, um, Sharon, I'm intrigued to know, did you get breakfast in bed? You did get breakfast in bed? Two. Wow, that's very impressive. You had a lot of children who could have helped with that too, I guess. So that, that would be good. Yeah, excellent. Good on you. Who, who's already got together with family members? Who's getting together with family members today? Lovely. Well, we do trust that you do have a, a happy Mother's Day. Certainly mums are an enormous blessing. Uh, maybe, Ben, if you want to start over this side. Um, that's right. And who, who's, got, who's coming with you? They're all very, the flowers are very popular. So Jesse and Asher, do you want to keep on handing out to all the other mums as well? So we want to follow Thomas over here and give out the flowers? That would be really good. And remember, when you give the mums their flowers, say Happy Mother's Day. Don't forget Pam here. So Gabriella, there's Pam here as well, see? Oh, we've gone past Pam. Pam was over here. <laughs> Frederick, here's Pam here with her hand up. See, do you want to give great work? Oh, that's it, lovely. Give it to Robin. We'll get them to you soon, Pam. <laughs> so there's still some ladies over here who need some. We certainly need to say Happy Mother's Day to Martha. There you go. Martha, happy Mother's Day to you. And Yan Jing, don't forget your mum in front of you. Oh, you. You hand them to her rather than through her hair, preferably. It's very functional, my family, isn't it? Oh, of course. Jonathan, I know you would do that for Marina, definitely. <laughs> very good. Well... Well done, kids. If there's some spare flowers, we can give it to the mums later on. How about I... Pro Actually, we do have a little DVD of some kids saying things that they value about... Or some people saying things they value about their mums. So have a look at this. What do you like most about your mother? I love her passion for singing. What do you like the most about your mother? That she's always there for me. What do you like most about your mother? That she loves me. What do you like most about your mother? kind she's really kind and really good friend and i can talk to her about nearly everything what do you like most about your mother oh she's very kind and caring what do you like most about your mother my mom's singing what do you like most about your mother because he lets us go on cruises what do you like most about your mother who care for food what do you like most about your mother she pushes me to be my best what do you like most about your mother? I like that she cares for me even if I'm mad at her and she always takes care of me even when I was little. What do you like most about your mother? I really enjoy her cooking. What do you like most about your mother? Because she cares and loves me. What do you like most about your mother? I appreciate that she prays for Mike and I and all our children. What do you like most about your mother? That she was unconditionally loving. Mothers are an enormous blessing to us, aren't they? So how about we thank God on Mother's Day, uh, recognising that God really is behind our families and uh, he's provided for us in, in loving mothers. So let's pray and thank God. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that you provide for us. We thank you for families. We thank you for mothers. We thank you that they love unconditionally, that they're kind, that they uh, work very hard to provide food and do so many wonderful things for us. Uh, Lord, just a fraction of those things have been recognised in that DVD then. But we do thank you, ultimately, that it's your good provision to provide families with mums. And we want to thank you as well 
uh, that you actually have this as an opportunity for Jesus to be shared through families and generations. Uh, we do pray, Lord, that this Mother's Day might be an enormous blessing for families. And we do pray that you continue to use mums to spread the good news of Jesus and to care for families and grow families in Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, kids, you're heading out these doors over here to Kids Church. And as you're heading out to Kids Church with the leaders, the rest of us are going to stand and sing. The song is Yet Not Christ. Uh, yet not I, but Christ in me. Let's stand and sing together.
now I invite you to um, pray with me, spend some time in prayer, and uh, that's a beautiful song, isn't it? So, yeah, let's pray. Dear Father God, as much as we try, we're really aware of all our imperfections. In the words of the song, so meaningful, what, what gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? To this I hold, my only hope, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Father, we thank you for this song. It's so true that without Jesus, we hope in vain. Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Our only hope is you. And we're so grateful for your never-ending grace. We praise and worship you, Lord. We thank you for so many things, Father. You've given us so much. Promise of eternity. You've given us a land, a great land to live in. So many things that we take for granted. Such variety in our food, jobs, income, comfy beds to sleep on. We especially thank you for your word to us as we read the Bible. Such a precious book. We thank you for families and friends. And Lord, we do thank you for our mothers. Under your sovereign plan, they brought us into this world that you created. We thank you for the role of our mothers or mother figures in our lives. Some mothers have passed away. We thank you for precious memories that we have and the legacy that they've left us. For those of us who are mothers, help us to be godly mothers who show and model the love of Christ to our families. Lord, we pray for the upcoming Cancer Council Big Morning Tea, Lord, just less than a week away now. We thank you that we as a church can support the work of Cancer Council but we especially want to pray for our guest speaker, Carolyn Altman, as she shares her story with us, that we will see clearly how her hope in Jesus made all the difference in the world. We ask that your Holy Spirit will prompt some people there at that um, morning tea to, to want to explore this hope for themselves and to come and be part of the Hope Explored sessions at the end, starting at the end of May. We just pray your blessing on that big morning team, Lord. It's a wonderful opportunity. Lord, we're, we're part of a church family and we do pray for each other. In whatever circumstance we're in, Lord, no matter whether we're young or old or in between, we pray that we will all grow in our walk with you daily. Help us not to grow stale and to be content to stay as we are. Give us all a burning desire to press on until our race is ended. To read our Bibles, to pray for our families, and friends, they don't all know you, to look for opportunities to point others to you, Jesus, as we know that without Jesus, we're lost. We want to pray for the kids in our church. We pray for those who teach and nurture them, parents, kids' church teachers, um, and even though they're young, we pray that they will become, uh, to, that they will come to know you and that they will understand you and put their trust in you as their saviour. 
and that they might grow into young women, men and women of Christ. We pray for those who are going through tough times in some way. May they know that you are with them. For those recovering from illnesses, give them your peace and healing according to your will. We pray for Ed as he starts a new phase of treatment this week. We pray for him. We thank you that for his faith. We pray that you will sustain him uh, in those circumstances, Lord. And as we've all been looking at Mark's gospel, we thank you that we see Jesus meeting people's needs. But not only that, at the same time, he stayed focused on what he was meant to be doing, on speaking the gospel, forgiveness of sins through his own death and resurrection. Help us too to be focused on the kingdom. And just like the blind man, help us to respond to you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity on the Central Coast um, to support scripture in schools. Thank you that our church supports that. And we do pray for the teachers, equip them, Lord, especially for Mike and for Wally, um, for the primary teachers and for the high school ones as well. We pray that they will teach well, that they will be faithful to you in the way that they teach, in what they teach, and how they do it. May they do it in love. We pray that the, the young people on the coast will hear the truth about Jesus and come to know him as their Redeemer and as their Heavenly Father. And Lord, not only do we have church family here, but we pray for the wider kingdom family, wherever they live. Use them as they serve you those who are persecuted for their faith strengthen them lord those who minister in prisons those who distribute bibles to bible groups and to people groups that need your word those who are missionaries grow your kingdom we ask father we pray now that you will speak to us through mike as he brings the message this morning from the next passage in Mark. Help us to listen closely and to really apply the truth of it to our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Is that working? Right. Good morning, everyone. Our reading this morning is Mark chapter 8, verses 11 to 26. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him, and they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth. No sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. The yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? <clears throat> Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Do you still not 
uh, see or understand. Have, are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? And they answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? The healing of a blind man at Bethesda. They came to Bethesda and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and he said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. And Jesus give us understanding of his precious word. Oh, that's what I'm looking for. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, for those of you who've been doing the Bible studies, <clears throat> they run in conjunction with our messages or the Connect groups. You might have already looked at this passage. Uh, today we're going to look at it uh, in a bit more detail and, uh, and see what we can learn from it to live out in our lives. Why don't we pray and ask for God's help? <clears throat> Lord God, we pray that you would open our eyes so that we would see and understand who Jesus is. Please open our hearts to be willing to be taught and led by Jesus as your chosen king. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, perhaps you've heard on the news this week about a dust storm in the United States where seven people were killed and 37 people were taken to hospital with injuries after a series of car crashes. It happened at 11 a.m. in the morning when strong winds whipped up a thick cloud of dust from the local fields and it covered the highway. Uh, 72 vehicles drove into the dust storm that looked like that, uh, including two semi-trailers, and almost all of them crashed and many of them caught on fire. What was the problem? The problem was the motors couldn't see. They couldn't see where they were going. And so they just drove on blindly straight ahead into disaster. Today we're warned, not about a dust storm, but the Bible actually warns us about the danger of not seeing clearly, not seeing Jesus clearly. And today we find various people who struggle with their sight. We meet people who are headed for disaster because their understanding of Jesus is really cloudy. They don't want to see Jesus. In fact, the problem is not that they can't see, but that they won't see who Jesus is. We find people who also have Jesus with them, but they can't see Jesus clearly. And then we meet a blind man, a man who is given sight by Jesus, but in a strange two-step process that results in his vision being blurred at first, and then in being given his sight fully, Jesus shows What's going on for the disciples and their inability to see Jesus clearly? So that's where we're going today in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 8, verses 11 to 26. And we want to ask for God's wisdom that we would see Jesus clearly. Uh, the first point that's on your outline there in front of you uh, that we're thinking about this morning is don't be like those who won't see. Now look at the start of the reading in verse 11. It says here, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. 
It's actually worth noting here that Jesus is back in Jewish territory. Uh, what we looked at last week of chapter 8 at the end, verse 10, it tells us that after feeding the 4,000, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanthu. Dalmanthu, Yutha. Dalmanthu. I can't say it very well. Louise did a great job of it last week. Here's a map uh, where that is. We think it's roughly on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus has been down in the southeast in Gentile territory on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. He's fed 4,000 people. Now he's returned to Jewish territory, back into this area of Galilee. And it's no surprise that in coming back to the Jewish territory, Jesus now encounters opposition from the Pharisees who this time are looking for a sign. Uh, This demand from the Pharisees for a sign, it seems to be rather significant because it's mentioned in all four Gospels. And there's no question that in asking for the sign, these Pharisees, well, they're being stubborn and argumentative. Because the fact is, Jesus has already given them a sign. And not just one sign, Jesus has given sign after sign after sign. Think about what we've seen just so far this year in Mark's Gospel. In Mark chapter 1, in one of their own synagogues, Jesus met a man with a demon. The demon even identified Jesus as the Holy One of God. And what did Jesus do? He said, be quiet, come out of him. And the impure spirit shakes the man and it comes out of him. In Mark chapter 2, in the presence of the Pharisees, he forgave a paralysed man's sins. And to prove that he actually had the authority to do that, he healed the paralysed man. He just told him to pick up his mat and go home. And he did. In Mark chapter 3, in another one of their synagogues, Jesus heals a man with a withered hand and he claims to be and shows to be that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus has raised a little girl from the dead. That's a pretty impressive sign, isn't it? bringing the dead back to life. And chapter 6, Mark, Jesus has fed 5,000 men plus women and children with just five loaves and two fish. And what do the Pharisees now ask for? They had the audacity to ask for a sign. They simply refuse to recognise Jesus for who he is because they don't want to acknowledge who he is. And so we read this in verse 8. Jesus sighs deeply and he says, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to it. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus sighs deeply. It's almost like a frustration, but these people who should have faith just won't see. The reality is Jesus has performed many miracles in their presence but they refuse to see who it is that's doing these miracles. It's not that they can't see the truth of who Jesus is and that they need a sign. The problem is that they won't see the truth about who Jesus is. There was a businessman who was driving uh, in his car. He was running late for an important meeting. As he pulled up in his uh, car beside the building where he was to have the meeting, he couldn't find a parking space anyway. anywhere. He was running late, so he started to, to frantically circle the block looking for a parking spot. The man got so desperate when he couldn't find a spot that he thought, I'll pray. This is what he prayed. He looked up to heaven and said, Lord, take pity on me. If you find me a parking space now, I'll go to church every Sunday for the rest of my life. And not only that, I'll give up my drinking. Straight away, a blinker came on on a car. The car pulled out and a parking space appeared. The guy looked back up to heaven and said, Never mind, Lord, I just found a spot. (laughs) In a similar way, the evidence for the Pharisees, it couldn't be clearer. It's crystal clear for them, but they can't see because they refuse to see. That's why Jesus leaves them without giving them a sign. It it wouldn't have done any good if Jesus did give them a sign to prove that he was Lord because they simply wouldn't see. They stubbornly refused to believe. You see, if we want to be truly wise, 
then we need to make sure that we're not like the Pharisees who think we know it all already. We need to be, ma- to be wise. We need to make sure we're not like the Pharisees who refuse to see Jesus for who he is and the fact that we need Jesus. See, our world wants to to suck us into this ignorant thinking that we don't need Jesus. So don't be like people who won't see Jesus. The second point for us to consider this morning is don't be like those who can't see Jesus. In other words, don't be like those who see Jesus and yet have no understanding of who he really is. In Mark's Gospel, this is, where the Phar- this is where the disciples are at at this point in time. They haven't yet figured it out, but Jesus is going to help them. Look at verse 13 and what happens after Jesus refuses to give the Pharisees a sign. We read that then he left them, he got back into the boat, and he crossed to the other side. So the disciples are again in the boat. This time they're going to the other side of the Lake of Galilee, which happens to be a little bit north on this occasion because we know where they land. And it's during this journey on this boat that we read a really interesting interaction between Jesus and his disciples. Look at verse 14. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Not surprisingly, the disciples are hungry. They've got one loaf of bread to share with all 13 of them. And Jesus, well, he doesn't seem particularly concerned as to whether or not they have bread. I guess he's already shown that he can meet their needs no matter how many loaves they have with them. But the disciples, they're certainly worried about this oversight of not bringing bread. Perhaps they've got a guilty conscience at this point in time. It's a teachable moment. And Jesus takes advantage of it. Have a look at verse 15. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Perhaps you, like our family, we've made our own bread rolls at home at various occasions. It's amazing how just a little bit of yeast can make the flour rise and it turn into bread from just this little teaspoon of yeast. The yeast permeates that whole lump of dough. It changes everything permanently. Luke chapter 12 tells us that the yeast of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. In other words, it's it's putting on a show, putting on the, pursuing the outward trappings of self-righteousness and self-glory. And Jesus warns that pursuing self-glory, pursuing self-righteousness, it's morally destructive, it's spiritually destructive. Longing for the outward trappings of success and power It can only end up corrupting us on the inside. Sounds like our world, doesn't it? Grab for yourself what you can. Achieve everything without anyone else's help. Jesus is warning his followers that thinking like the world, it's dangerous. And for his disciples in the boat that day, Jesus is saying, don't be like the world around you. Don't let that sin of pride, the corruption of Herod and the Pharisees, don't let that infiltrate your life. It's a powerful lesson. But the disciples, they're not thinking about spiritual lessons, they're thinking about their stomachs. Have a listen to verse 16. They discussed this with one another and said, ah, It's got to be because we have no bread. (laughs) Mark's pointing out these guys are really slow learners. They're so concerned about figuring out who is to blame for having no bread, but they actually ignore the warning of Jesus about the yeast of the Pharisees. So Jesus says this to them in verse 17. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts calloused? More literally, the question of Jesus is, do you have a calloused heart? It's not their discussions which is being condemned by Jesus. It's their lack of faith, their lack of spiritual perceptiveness. They're as blind as ever. They just can't see. That's what Jesus says to them in verse 18, isn't it? He says, do you have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember 
When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? See, these disciples, they haven't yet figured out that Jesus is Lord. It doesn't matter if they've only got one role for 13 people. Jesus can take that, what they have, and use it to meet all of their needs as well as the needs of many other people as well. They don't need the wealth, the power of the Pharisees, the Lord Herod. They have everything they need in Jesus. But they can't yet see it. The disciples are not like the Pharisees who won't see. The problem for the disciples is that they can't see. And sometimes we can be like that too. Sometimes we forget all that we have in Jesus. We forget the freedom, the freedom from guilt, the forgiveness of sins that we have in Jesus. We forget his love. We doubt his love as we focus on ourselves. We wonder, will I be able to meet all my needs, worrying if I've got enough, rather than trusting Jesus that he'll provide what we need. See, we're like the disciples too. We forget what we have in Jesus. A couple of years ago, Stan Caffey and his fiance were preparing to get married by cleaning out the garages of their respective homes as they prepared to get married. Uh, between their garages, the two garages, they had an assortment of clothes to sell, bicycles, tools, computer parts, and a tattered copy of the American Declaration of Independence, a copy of it that had been hanging in Stan's garage for years. A guy called Michael Sparks came along and purchased that copy of the American uh, De Declaration of Independence for $2.50. It turned out it was incredibly valuable. This particular copy of the American Declaration of Independence was a very rare copy from the early 1800s. He later auctioned that same copy off for $477,650. The news heard this story about this windfall this man had made, so they went back to the original owner, Stan Caffey, to say, were you disappointed in giving up something so valuable and selling it when you could have got so much more money for it? Stan Caffey, the previous owner, said this, I'm happy for that Sparks guy. If I still had it, it would still be hanging here in the garage and I wouldn't even know it was valuable at all. I think that describes some Christians sometimes. They like to have Jesus hanging around, but they don't really know what he's worth. See, some Christians, they don't realise what we have in Jesus Christ. They forget the supreme treasures that we have in Christ. The freedom, the forgiveness, the strength and courage, the friendship, the new life, all these things that we have in Jesus. I wonder, can you see what you have in Jesus? Don't be like those who won't see. Don't be like those who can't see. Instead, be people who see Jesus clearly. Ask Jesus to open your eyes to see him clearly. Have a look at what happens to this blind man in verse 22. The disciples came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. It's interesting here that it's not just the faith of the blind man, but it's also the faith of other people that led them to bring him to Jesus for help. I guess that points out a really helpful truth for us. That not only do we come to Jesus for help for ourselves, but we come to Jesus seeking help for other people as well, don't we? It's an interesting truth. And in going outside the village, I guess that's heading to a place of quiet where the man and the disciples can see and understand Jesus and this miracle and it all not be a show for everyone around. We read this in verse 23. When he'd spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. In other words, he has some sight, but it's all very blurry. Did he have sight and lose it to know what trees look like? Perhaps. He could have been familiar with what a tree and a person looked like from just having touched them potentially as a blind man. That's not really the point. What's happening here is that after the first touch, his eyesight is not 
clean. So what's happened? Well, it clearly can't be that Jesus wasn't powerful enough to heal him because it's the only miracle that we read in the Gospels of where Jesus heals someone and it's not complete with one touch. Some people have suggested that perhaps there was a lack of faith on the part of the blind man. Certainly, his vision, his blurred vision, is only temporary. Look at what happens in verse 25. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, don't even go into the village. So it's with this second touch that everything becomes clear. And some people have suggested that this two-stage healing is a picture that physical healing for us can be gradual. I'm not so sure that's the point of it. I actually think this is a teaching moment of Jesus with his disciples. This two-stage healing of this blind man is a picture of what Jesus' disciples are going through in their own spiritual journey. You see, in terms of their understanding of Jesus as the Christ, their insight is growing. For some time they've been with Jesus. They've seen all the miracles. They've realised that Jesus is someone special. He's worth following. But just like the blind man's vision was blurred, these disciples are still not clear on who Jesus is. Hence Jesus saying to them only a little bit earlier, having seen all these miracles in verse 21, Jesus had said to them, do you still not understand? In other words, your vision, it should be clear by now, guys. It's going to take a few more encounters with Jesus. But eventually they will see Jesus clearly. And next week we'll see one of the disciples does get it. They identify Jesus as the Messiah. But even then, even still we'll see the vision is all blurred about who the Messiah is. You see, this gradual healing of this blind man, it's a picture of the disciples, of their gradual spiritual growth, of their understanding of Jesus. It takes a while for it to become clear. It's the same for us sometimes, isn't it? Our spiritual understanding, our enlightenment of who Jesus is, it's sometimes slow. But the more we seek a touch from Jesus, the more we invest in God's words, the more we will see Jesus the clearer our vision will become. And an interesting truth is that sometimes it's in hard times that we go through in life that we actually see Jesus more clearly as we trust and follow him. See, Mark's Gospel was written at a time when Christians were suffering under the persecution of a Roman guy called Nero. They were experiencing Christians in those days the most horrendous trials. There were beatings, burnings, bloody massacres and Mark makes it clear that Jesus is Lord even of those hard times. Sometimes it's hard to see Jesus clearly when you're going through a difficult life moment but keep on trusting in Jesus. He has all authority. He is in control. There's a well-known hymn writer called Fanny Crosby She was only six weeks old when she developed a minor eye inflammation. It was a simple thing to treat, even in the 1820s when she was born. Uh, All the doctor needed to do was to put some material on her eyes with a little bit of medication. Only the doctor that treated Fanny Crosby was careless. He used too much medication and she went totally and permanently blind. She later said in life, of that doctor, she said, if I could meet him now, I would say thank you over and over and over again for making me blind. Why? Why would she say that? She said, my blindness is a gift from God. It's helped me to see Jesus in a way that others seldom can see Jesus. See, her blindness had actually given her a spiritual insight that few ever had. See, we need to be people who keep on trusting Jesus, who want to see him clearly, even in those hard times, even when life doesn't make sense. See, difficulties can give us a spiritual insight and a picture of Jesus that we never had before. At first, things might be unclear. We might even be upset or angry about what's going on. We might not fully understand, but Jesus is Lord, even in the midst of our trials. And if we keep on looking to Jesus, eventually things will become clear. Keep trusting Jesus. Keep investing in his word and we will see Jesus clearly. 
Let's not be people who won't see Jesus. Don't be like those people who see Jesus and all the blessings that we can have in him. Let's be people who do see Jesus, who let Jesus touch us not just once, but as many times as it takes. In other words, no matter how hard life gets, keep trusting Jesus, keep following him, and eventually we will see. Will we pray that we do? Let's pray that we do that. Lord God, we thank you so much for Jesus and all the blessings we have in him. Thank you for the forgiveness, for the new life that we've found in Jesus. Lord, we're sorry for all the times that we've not seen Jesus clearly, that we've not looked to him. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to see Jesus clearly. Give us a heart to know your word and to live for you. And when tough times come, Lord, please enable us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, to keep trusting you, knowing that you will hold us close to yourself and work things out according to your good plans. And we ask this in Jesus' mighty name for his glory. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a Fanny Crosby song to end. That was the blind songwriter who wrote many countless number of hymns. There's hundreds and hundreds. The hymn is, To God be the glory for the things that he has done. What's the greatest thing he's done? He sent his son to die on a cross so that we can be forgiven. Why don't we stand and sing together? Jesus for all he is.
Because sometimes we forget all the things that we've got in Christ. Um, so our freedom, our forgiveness, our friendship with Jesus. So let's over morning tea remind each other of all the things that we've got in Jesus so that we can beautifully see him lovely. Thank you.